Uh, I, it's my pleasure. Uh, you're getting a real stack of attorneys today. Um, you know, we had Ali in here, and he was an attorney, and now we've got a panel of a bunch of them. Um, this is going to be a really interesting, uh, interesting set um, about uh, the uh, weaponization and regulation of security research, something that's pretty important to a lot of us here. Uh, I'm not going to introduce everybody individually. I'll probably let Jim take care of that. Um, so let's give, uh, let's give our panel a big hand. Good job, guys. Well done. Okay. Good job. Thank you for coming to our panel. Uh, this, is, uh, this is License to Own, the Weaponization of Security Research. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to explore this important issue with us. Uh, this is a, a unique time for the entire information security community, and here's why. The U.S. government is implementing rules that could change the way information security is practiced in the United States. And more than that, it could even affect the way that we talk about information security, the, the way information is exchanged amongst us here. Uh, and if that sounds like a big deal, it is. And that's, that's not an overstatement at all of, of, the, of the situation that we're currently looking at. Uh, specifically, some new regulations are being proposed by the Bureau of Industry and Security, also known as BIS, as we'll refer to it here. Uh, that's, a that's within the U.S. Department of Commerce. The stated mission of BIS is to administer and enforce dual-use export controls on various technologies, uh, such as body armor, bulletproof windshield glass, encryption, uh, most relevant to what we're doing, and that, uh, uh, that those charges are now being expanded to, uncover, to cover some technologies that we're seeing more often here in this, in this room even. Uh, so this is an opportunity for us to organize and to present a coherent explanation of our concerns uh, with respect to the regulations that are being proposed. Uh, so with that, uh, let me introduce our fantastic panel uh, that we have here uh, in alphabetical order uh, for the folks that are here at the table first. Uh, Dave Itell is an offen offensive security expert whose company Immunity is hired by major companies to try to hack their computer networks. Uh, to find and fix vulnerabilities that criminal hackers, organized crime, and nation state adversaries could use. The company is well known for <laughs> developing several advanced hacking tools used by the security industry, such as Swarm, Canvas, Silica, Stalker, Accomplice, Spike, Spike Proxy, Unmask, and most recently, Innuendo, the first US made nation grade cyber implant with flame Stuxnet like malware capabilities. Matt Blaze is a professor in the computer science department at the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on the architecture and design of secure systems based on cryptographic techniques, analysis of secure systems against practical attack models, and finding new cryptographic primitives and techniques. Uh, as you surely must know, in 1994 he discovered a serious flaw in the U.S. government's Clipper encryption system. He is interested, yeah, right? he's interested in the use of encryption in various physical security systems, and that work has yielded an attack against virtually all commonly used master key mechanical locks. Nate Cardozo is a staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He, he focuses on the intersection of technology, privacy, and free expression. He has defended the rights of anonymous bloggers, sued the United States government for access to improperly classified documents, lobbied Congress for sensible reform of American surveillance laws. In addition, he works on the EFF Coders Rights Project, counseling hackers, academics, and security professionals at all stages of the research. Mara Tam is a researcher and historian of policy, justice, culture, and security. She has authored, co-authored, and contributed research for technical policy papers in the fields of international security and arms control. After earning a first-class degree in art history, Mara's work supported bilateral negotiations toward peaceful nuclear cooperation between the United States and India. She has been a participant, speaker, and panelist in academic conferences and cultural studies, languages, and history, including the Intangible Security Initiative convened by NATO and the European Science Foundation. And today, uh, we have with us also, by remote presence, a uh, very special guest, uh, Randy Wheeler of the Bureau of Industry and Security. Uh, we are momentarily challenged with the AV. We'll, we'll see her later, uh, but she, she's with us, and uh, we can see her, and, and she can hear us, and she'll be able to hear you. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, can, I can tell you a little bit about her. She, is, uh, she has served as the director of the Information uh, Technology Controls Division of the Bureau of Industry and Security's Office of National Security and Technology Transfer Control since 2006. So she's in charge of this. This is great. Uh, Mrs. Wheeler was detailed to serve as acting chair of the operating committee, uh, the interagency body that resolves disagreements among reviewing agencies. Uh, and uh, her experience here is incredibly relevant 
for this task that we have here of trying to get to uh, rules uh, that uh, our community can live with and that also uh, are in, that also forward the mission, the stated mission of, of the BIS. Uh, so uh, we can't uh, thank her enough for taking the time to, to be with us today. And uh, I'm, I'm the moderator uh, for this uh, lovely panel. I'm Jim DeNaro. I'm a data security and intellectual property attorney. I'll, I also advise hackers on how to stay out of trouble or at least get in less trouble. Uh, so with that said, let's dive into the meat of this. But this is really about export control. And it's a really kind of in the weeds subject. And to, to really understand the significance of the rules that are being proposed and how uh, they would affect the community in such a fundamental way, it's worth taking a moment to just explore what is export control, how does it apply to you, how could it apply to you, and why does it matter? Uh, so just a few notes of background before we get into the meat of this particular uh, situation here. So the U.S. government controls the exports of sensitive equipment, software, and technology as a means of promoting national security interests and foreign policy objectives. This control is achieved by requiring people and companies to apply for licensing before exporting the articles that are covered by the, by the rules. So the question is, what's covered by export control? That's really this, what the debate is here. So at a high level, we can break it into two categories. First, there are traditional defense articles. That's not really at issue here. Uh, they have their own licensing regime. These are things that have no commercial application. They are covered by ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. These include, for example, armored combat, ground vehicles, think tanks, uh, as well as something perhaps a little more relevant for us here, computers that are specifically designed or developed for military applications. Uh, second, in our space here, we have items that are considered to have both commercial and military application. These are considered to be dual use items, and that, that's a term of art. Uh, they are controlled by the export administration regulations uh, for software and technology. The covered technologies include things such as high performance computers and encryption, uh, which many of you have probably come across. Uh, already. In fact, the schedule of controlled goods even has uh, a section entitled information security. Uh, so you're already kind of <laughs> in, 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 uh, in range here. Uh, but th those rules are really principally about cryptography and that's where you, that's what you'd see the most. Uh, so for, for these dual use licenses, the U.S. Department of Commerce receives uh, somewhere between 12,000 to 14,000 uh, applications a year for this type of um, export activity. And compliance matters. Uh, for, du for, for these dual-use export control violations, criminal penalties can reach a maximum of $500,000 per violation, uh, and an individual person can get up to 10 years imprisonment. Dual-use violations can also be the subject of civil fines of up to $12,000 per violation, as well as denial of export privileges. Uh, and in some cases, both civil and criminal cases uh, can be brought. So the stakes are, are fairly high um, at this point. Uh, but so far, in the, in the world we've been living in, we, no, nobody in the community has been concerned that exploits or zero days uh, or, or even things like the hacking team system were uh, the subject of much <coughs> export control, uh, if any at all. So there was no concern there. But that's changing. That brings us today. And what you may have, referred, what you may have heard of as the Wassenaar Arrangement. Uh, the Western Arrangement is a group of 41 countries that have agreed to control certain dual-use items. The U.S. participates in this group, and the list of controlled goods is updated every year. Uh, so here's where it gets interesting. In 2013, the Wassenaar Arrangement agreed to add certain things to the list. And this is the text of the, of the Wassenaar Arrangement. Uh, you, I wouldn't uh, expect you to read this now, and it's too small anyway, but the key here, uh, the key bit of language is that intrusion software uh, will be regulated as a dual-use item. And as you can, I'm sure already you've, a thousand questions uh, occur to you, what even is intrusion software, how would you do this, and, and so on. Uh, so that's really, that, 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 that's the, the item here uh, that, that, we're, that we're interested in. Uh, so the U.S. has committed to implementing the Wassenaar Arrangement Agreement on, at the national level here in the United States. So rules will have to be written and enforced here for, for all of us uh, in the United States that regulate this. Uh, and on May 20th, 2015, the BIS published its proposed rules for implementing this Wassenaar arrangement locally. Uh, and most notably, and a particular concern to um, those in the, 
the, the information security and research community. These rules seem to go beyond uh, the bare requirements of, of this uh, relatively simple looking uh, statement here, and that's been uh, a cause of much concern that, that we'll be uh, addressing in particular here. So comments were, were taken on the, on the proposed rules, and uh, in light of those comments, some things are happening, and we'll, we'll hear about what the response to those, those comments has been. So that's just a broad outline of, of what it is that we're talking about and, and why we're here today and, and why, it, why it matters. So here's the, the, the plan, what we're going to do going forward on the panel. Each panelist here comes at the issues from a somewhat different perspective uh, and has some brief opening remarks. So we're going to hear those remarks uh, by uh, various of the panelists uh, and then uh, we'll dive into, into some more questions and, and uh, hopefully things will get pretty engaging. Uh, so with that... Uh, Mara is going to uh, kick it off. Yay. So, are, are you doing, are you running the slides? Or? Let me give you the slides. <laughs> we are so good at this. Yeah, technology. Woo. Right, so this is going to be a really uh, quick and dirty introduction to dual-use export controls. Um, what are they for? Uh, basically to avoid this. Um, dual-use export controls are controls designed to monitor and regulate the ecosystems around weapons of mass destruction, or at least that's where we get our modern export control regimes from. Uh, here's some of the stuff that export control is meant to regulate. Uh, we have weapons of mass casualty, nuclear, explosive and incendiary, weapons of mass disruption, which probably doesn't mean what you think it means. Disruption actually means something a lot worse than sort of the uber definition. Hey, a puppy. So, <laughs> so the core logic of export control is non-proliferation. Uh, it is controlling the spread of dangerous technologies, and this is done through a couple of mechanisms. One of them is the tr through uh, controlling the transfer of knowledge, which is deemed export. Um, this is obviously going to be of concern to a lot of people in this room. Uh, and then there's the transfer of stuff, or required stuff. Uh, and this is where we get a bit into dual use. So is this thing required for this other thing to be made? Uh, and the way that we target this is through identifying choke point technologies. You want to find something where if you control it, you can control further progress in the development cycle. And these are really difficult to identify uh, because they can't be ubiquitous. They have to be rare and or conspicuous because you need to be able to control every iteration of it or close to it. Uh, so you can see why for intrusion and surveillance software, that principle sort of falls apart immediately. Uh, command and delivery platforms just, they, they are too ubiquitous, they don't, that doesn't work. Um, so here's a short history of the ex sort of dual use arrangements that we have to work with and, and the international agreements for export control that have happened sort of in the modern era. Uh, we started off with the OEEC, which this was an out, uh, like an offshoot of the Marshall Plan, um, and they turned into the OECD, uh, and their counterpart is the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, the, CM, uh, the CMEA, which we, because we are adults, decided to call Comicon. So arms exports to Comicon were controlled under COCOM, and these are the original COCOM countries. Uh, so this is what we had from about just after the Second World War until uh, the mid-90s. And the successor to COCOM is the Vassenaar Arrangement, which sort of mashes together Comicon and, OE and OECD in this sort of lovely mix, and this is what we're stuck with now. 
And these are all of the U.S. task force agencies tasked with export control reform. Like all great bureaucratic disasters, this one was inherited from the Cold War. And this is one of the issues that we have right now is that there are just so many people involved in this process that getting good regulation is really hard. Um, so the question I want to leave you with is why is a bug like a bomb? What is it about intrusion and surveillance software and possibly exploits that lends them or does not lend them to regulation under, dual use, under a dual use export control regime? And Okay, with that, uh, we'll switch to uh, Randy Wheeler. So let's see how we're going to make this work. So do you want to, if we put the mic? Um, oh, you can just share the whole screen. That's perfect. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. All right, can I plug okay. this in? Yes. And you can switch back to the slide stuff. Okay. So we've got to get the mic for her. Okay. Okay. Can so audio you... test for her? Okay. Can you hear us? Can we hear, we can't hear her. What if we take this out? Can you hear her? Can we hear her now? Let's put the mic on this. Randy, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Swear just put the mic on this. <laughs> Make it really loud. This is gonna work. This, this is a terrible idea. Yes, it is. Okay. Can, okay, can you speak like a giant? <laughs> and are you, can, can she say something? Randy, can you say something? Yes, I can say something. Oh. Yeah. Can you hear this? Yay, okay. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> Why is my dog up? Why is my dog up? Why is this? She, she does not look like a dog. She, she is a human being. I can internet, hear lots of people. No okay, why is this? Just drag it over to the next monitor. <laughs> Sorry? Just drag it over. Hmm? Wait, what? Just drag Randy over to the screen. There you oh, go. Oh, hey. Look, it's Randy. Why? All right. Okay, so. So then how do we full screen it? Yeah. Um, no. Yay! Hey. Okay. What okay. just happened? <laughs> we, we finally got you on screen. <laughs> Personally, or the slides? You personally. You yourself. Oh my goodness. Okay, I realize you can't see everybody, but um, uh, wave hello to DEF CON. <laughs> hello, DEF CON 23. No, let's, don't, don't turn it around. Don't fuck, don't turn it around. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we... Okay, so we're saying hi to her. So yeah. She can... Okay, so... Uh, I might say Oops. Okay, so uh, due to some unexpected technical issue, we cannot see Randy and her slides at the same time. So now that we've all had a chance to, um, or at least, um, you know, you've had a chance to say hi to her anyway, uh, we're going to have to uh, switch over to her slides. So you'll hear her, uh, you'll hear her but not uh, see her. This is a two-hour uh, yeah. meeting right. for obvious reasons. <laughs> Several hours of technical fail. Okay. All set? Yep. We got your slides up. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this panel. I really appreciate the opportunity to address the folks at DEF CON. And I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of the proposed controls on intrusion software items and IP network surveillance systems in the export administration regulations that Nate uh, mentioned earlier. Next slide. Yep. So 
Oops, my next slide isn't working here. <laughs> so, as Nate had mentioned in the Export Administration Regulations, we have controls, national security controls on computers, telecommunications, and information security. These listed items appear in the commerce control list, which is part of the Export Administration regulations. And uh, there are other, of course, other categories as well. The category four, five part one, and five part two controls are the responsibility of my division, the Information Technology Controls Division. We process approximately 2,500 export license applications and also 2,000 commodity classification requests per year. To date, uh, most of our work has been in the encryption area in the category five part two, partly because over the past several years, as everybody knows, everything has encryption in it and so items that uh, would have been in the Category 4, Category 5, Part 1, have moved over into the encryption control section. In, within each category, there are entries, as I think Nate also mentioned, for commodities, test equipment, software, and technology. The Information Technology Controls Division comprises nine licensing officers, including myself, and we have three electronics engineers on the staff and six export policy analysts. Next slide, please. The new control list entries that are the subject of the proposed rule are three related list entries in category four. And as Nate said, uh, systems, equipment, software, components, especially designed or modified for the generation, operation, or delivery of or communication with intrusion software. We also have a separate technology control or technology required for the development of said intrusion software. And then the proposed rule uh, also includes a definition of intrusion software. There's also a separate entry for the IP network communication surveillance systems in category five, part one, telecommunications. Next slide, please. As uh, Nate noted, the these control list entries were proposed in the Vossenar arrangement in 2013, and they were adopted by the plenary in December 2013. It's worth noting that the Category 4 and Category 5 proposals were submitted by two different countries uh, aimed at covering two different types of products. And uh, the in interesting thing about them was that they both had an element of human rights uh, in the uh, purpose of the control. The category four controls were aimed at offensive systems that are, were being sold not on the commercial market but um, directly to governments of uh, potentially repressive regimes to be used uh, against their citizens. And the same uh, element was present in the proposal for the Category 5 Part 1 uh, monitoring surveillance systems. Once the Bosnia arrangement agrees to a new control list entry, it is added to the, the multilateral Bosnia control list. And then it's up to each member country to implement the control in its own list pursuant to its own statutory and regulatory authorities. In the United States, the uh, dual use list for national security products is implemented in the commerce control list. So the process is to draft a rule and to uh, 
issue the rule, usually as a final rule, usually in the May or June timeframe in the year following the adoption on the Bossinar list. Between December 2013 and May 2015, there was a great deal of interagency discussion on how to implement these new control list entries. In the export administration regulations, uh, we have a reason for control or several reasons for control for the same item. We need to determine the licensing policy, license exceptions that may apply, and in this case, we needed to consider that there was overlap with existing encryption controls. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of products have moved over into Category 5 Part 2 over the past years because they have added encryption. In this case, we already had controls on penetration testing products that included encryption and at times cryptanalytic functionality and had been licensing them under Category 5 Part 2. So part of the question was, what do we do with those products? Do we change the treatment of them? And uh, in the proposed rule, there is a, a much tighter restriction on the export of all products that could be described under the new control list entries, including the penetration testing products. We published the proposed rule in May 2015 with a request for public comments. And boy, did we receive comments. We had received uh, almost 300 comments, uh, totaling some almost 1,000 pages. Many of them are very thoughtful. Before the comment period was over, we received many requests to meet with various groups and uh, sets of uh, industry coalitions and so forth. We um, were very, very uh, grateful that there was such interest in uh, talking to us and explaining the issues that the proposed rule raises. There are three uh, areas that the comments have raised. The first was the uh, U.S. implementation in the proposed rule, and as I mentioned, the restrictive license requirements that it, and uh, the no availability of license exceptions, which uh, places a li export license requirement on all destinations except Canada and uh, all government and non-government end users and would require an export license for intra-company and uh, internal use in companies for uh, technology and software, and it would also impose a license requirement on deemed exports. As Nate uh, mentioned very briefly, the release of technology or source code to a foreign national in the United States is considered to be an export to the home country of the foreign national. And we do receive a fairly large number of deemed export license applications each year uh, by companies who want to release controlled technology to employees who are uh, not U.S. nationals. And uh, this, uh, these deemed export license uh, requirements would apply to the new control list entries uh, without any exception. The proposed rule also set forth a very restrictive licensing policy um, with uh, approval only to four countries and case by case to all other uh, destinations. In, a, in addition to the national security reason for control, it imposed a regional stability reason for control, which is very restrictive and it set forth the licensing policy under the regional stability provisions of the regulations. Finally, the proposed rule set forth a denial policy for products with zero day or root, cut, root kit functionality. Now, these terms did not appear in the Bossinar text. This is in addition on a licensing policy basis in the proposed rule. Second, and we, we, we were expecting the uh, comments on the restrictive uh, proposed implementation. 
but we also received a very large uh, set of comments on the text of the Boston Art Control List entries as well. In particular, the definition of intrusion software raises many questions and issues, and the other panelists will address some of those. And there are many concerns about the scope of the control on technology or development of the uh, intrusion software as defined. Finally, um, there were other issues raised even beyond the boss in our text that are very important to consider. The likelihood that the imposition of these controls would achieve the purpose of addressing human rights and uh, the likelihood that they would um, even cause more harm to security research generally. In addition, there are a number of comments that noted that the restriction on sharing of technology on cybersecurity research appears to be at cross purposes with other government initiatives, including pending legislation to encourage the sharing of such information. I forgot to tell you to change the slide, I'm sorry. So we're now at the very last slide that says next steps. Uh, the next steps in the regulatory process, we're in the process of reviewing the comments. And again, we do appreciate all the time and effort that uh, all types of uh, companies and researchers and uh, um, industry representatives and industry coalitions took to uh, put their thoughts down on paper. We are planning to discuss the comments, the issues raised in the comments in a series of technical advisory committee meetings in the rest of the calendar year. And um, although Mara mentioned that there are so many uh, government agencies involved in export control, we found that in this process there were a number of government agencies who are with expertise in the cybersecurity area who were not involved in the development of the rule, and we hope to uh, have them participate with us in the open discussions with the uh, constituencies who are interested in the issue in the open meetings in the technical advisory committees for the rest of the calendar year. Also, given the issues raised, we will uh, consult with our boss and our partners. Uh, a number of the other member countries have already implemented these control list entries in their national control lists and apparently without uh, some of the um, reaction that we've uh, received uh, when we published the proposed rule. So we would like to talk to them about uh, the entries and find out uh, how the implementation is affecting their industries and research community as well. Following these three steps, we, tend, we intend to draft a revised proposed rule, and again, we would have an opportunity for public comments before we would publish a final rule that would go into effect. And with that, uh, again, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate, and I look forward to hearing the other uh, panel members' presentations. Uh, thank you for that, Randy. That was um, a very helpful explanation. And uh, thank you to the um, members of the audience also for uh, staying with us for this um, explanation of what it is we're talking about and, and what, what the rules are uh, and how this process moves forward. This is a back and forth process between the research community and many other stakeholders uh, that are interested in how the technologies for, that, that are used in surveillance software uh, may be, may be maybe regulated on a global scale. Uh, so this is the framework, these are the, the, the parameters that, that we're working with, and uh, with that we can take a, a deeper dive into how the proposed rules are going to uh, potentially have some very significant impacts on uh, the, the various interests. Um, uh, so with that, uh, Nate, I'd like to take it. Sure. Um, do you want to pull up my slide? Yes, do you want to? Okay. Um, and actually, if we could maybe switch seats once, you, once your slides are pulled up so that I can read yeah. the notes on it. Oh,
Is there a presentation there? Okay, so I guess I don't have my notes, but that's okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Nate Cardozo. I'm a staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, as as Jim mentioned earlier. And I'm good. I I love technology, so I'm going to pull up my notes on a phone and do the uh, the slides from the computer, since we can't do both. John Gilmore in 1993 or thereabouts uh, told us that the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. That statement is as true today as it was more than 20 years ago when, when uh, Gilmore told us. Um, and in fact it is far more true today than it was then. Back in the 90s, uh, the export of, and this is a, a gross oversimplification, the export of cryptography uh, was controlled under ITAR, under the United States Munitions List, uh, as a weapon. Um, so this slide could not be exported from the United States. Nowadays, we're left with the Vosnar arrangement. Uh, EFF uh, sued uh, on behalf of Dan Bernstein in the 90s. Uh, uh, we won. We, we got a ruling that said code is speech. And uh, Cryptography was moved out of ITAR and into the EAR, the Export Administration Regulations. Uh, now, of course, we're dealing with Vosnar. Why? This is the problem that Vosnar was designed to solve. Right? That's an Enigma machine. Uh, Enigma was actually designed uh, to protect German banking. Uh, it was a commercial encryption device uh, that was, of course, uh, repurposed during the war uh, to to at, at least at first great effect. Um, this is also the problem that Vosnar was designed to solve. Not really, of course. Uh, you know, the, the, the MakerBot is, is not, not controlled under Vosnar. Um, but guns are, right? Not guns per se, but nerve gas precursors, etc. cetera. Um, but what about information? How do you control the export of information? And I would propose to you that it's not going to work any better this time than it did the last time. Because we have things like this. Right? I can export information very, very easily. But what do we do? Right? There is an actual problem here. And it's a significant one. What do we do about things like this? Uh, Finfisher, hacking team. These are pieces of software that I really don't want in the hands of repressive regimes around the world. What do we do about it? Uh, as, as Randy said, one of the things about the way that export controls work, especially in the United States and, uh, and the way that the proposed rule that we're talking about today works, is that it controls exports, period, to anyone, uh, you know, talking to your coworker who is not a U.S. person, that's controlled. It doesn't matter whether uh, you're, you're selling uh, Finfisher to the government of Ethiopia or uh, selling Metasploit to a pen tester uh, in Chile. Uh, th those are both controlled. One of those uses I'm just fine with. The other one I'm not so happy about. But there are already tools available. Um, and, and I would suggest that going to a, an, an end use or an end, use, end user control uh, is, is a lot better, right? This is, a, this is an actual Cisco slide uh, talking about how Cisco is going to help the Chinese government build the Golden Firewall to combat Falun Gong, even evil religion, and other hostilities. This kind of thing is what we should be worried about. We should be worried about uh, our technology companies building the tools of human rights abuse. Um, the Vosnar arrangement is intended to control things like this, but it ends up sweeping way too much in uh, because it doesn't take an end use, end user uh, control. Um, here's, here's, you know, an, another, another thing that, that I'm worried about. This is, of course, a hacking team email um, talking about uh, sales to the government of Ethiopia. Um, 
I, at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, am representing an Ethiopian American suing the government of Ethiopia, not for hacking team, but for Finn Fisher, uh, for wiretapping his Skype calls. Uh, so I would propose to you that there are other tools besides a blanket export control regime um, that are better suited to holding companies uh, responsible for uh, doing things like building the Great Firewall of China and the specific Falun Gong evil religion plug-in that Cisco built, uh, or uh, Finn Fisher selling to the government of Ethiopia with full knowledge that it was being used against journalists, activists, uh, dissidents, um, and, and uh, the diaspora. So that's where I come from, uh, and I'll turn it over to who, who goes next? Matt? Dave. So David. Sure. All right. I just hand me the clicker if you want. So I'm just going to start off real quick with, um, I guess, a re-bio in case you forgot uh, who I am and why I'm here talking to you guys. And the reason for that is that, uh, you know, my first employer out of, uh, well, during college, in fact, was the National Security Agency. And I've since started Immunity, which is a company many of you guys know of only because we have a free debugger, which is surprising to me, but that shows how awesome uh, my marketing skills are. Uh, I also have a mailing list called Daily Dave, which is discussing a lot of this Vasanar, I can't pronounce it properly, uh, activity. And we became very concerned when we first saw it coming down the pike. Uh, in particular because we, we sell to the, the general public three uh, or four major tools. We have Canvas, which, which competes with uh, Metasploit Pro and Core Impact. And I assume many of you have used one of these tools to do operational penetration testing, which is something that is required by PCI, required by HIPAA, required by almost everything that is security related. Uh, of course, we also sell Silica, which does wireless penetration testing, which qualifies as a crypto analytic tool under the BIS regulations. We also have a conference called Infiltrate, which focuses on offensive and, and attack technologies and offers people a way to be very honest about what it is we do. Uh, and so, you know, my whole life has been spent building command and delivery platforms, essentially, and, and uh, that's the exact sort of behavior that these things, these people, some people find uncomfortable, but which is in fact a necessary part of our existence in order to understand and secure ourselves. And it's been said that, uh, it's been said that Prezi won't come up on his laptop, but it's also been said that uh, defense is the child of offense. And so for those of us in this room who work on offensive things, I think we can all spend one hour of our time to reply to the simple to use website, and it surprised me more than anybody, that BIS has an amazingly easy to use website for submitting your comments. You can read, a, read the regulation in about 15 minutes. You'll never understand it, so don't even try. But you can read it, and then you can write comments on it that say what, how it would affect your daily life, and it'll take you about an hour. You can do it during Simpsons reruns or something, so you can make it funny. Just don't include curse words or anything crazy. And uh, I think the next round for comments should not be 1,000 pages. I think it should be 100,000 pages. I think that Randy would very much enjoy having everyone at this conference, everyone here is impacted by this rule in a major way. That's the only reason I'm involved because, uh, you know, we, we pay our lawyers a lot of money to keep us out of trouble, but no one in this room wants to pay these lawyers all that money. They, they do, obviously, the lawyers in this room. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but the lawyers would, would enjoy that. Um, and I don't think you should have to. And, and I think it's a uniquely un-American thing to control the export of information, which, uh, you know, in a sense, the human voice is the original export technology for information. And I think we should try to keep that voice free from any kind of overbearing regulation as a matter of course. We almost have Prezi. That's amazing. I can go on for hours. Can I have a little clicky thing? Thank you. You're still not up on that. I'm not up on the screen yet, but we're close. We're close. Oh, there it is. Can we make it full screen? That'd be amazing. There you go. Boom. All right. Okay, so 
Here's my perspective on this, and it's also your perspective at the end of my five minutes, which is that export control is a bad idea for anything in this area, and we've been talking a lot about the intrusion software part of it. Intrusion software, let me say, is already them trying to, to frame the discussion because when they say intrusion software, they mean anything that does anything useful in security. And when they say surveillance software, they also link in anything that does intrusion detection and anti-crime work on any scale. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But this, I believe, is should be and is definitely the, and Randy can't see it. I'm sorry, Randy. It says here, you can see it? No, she has no. seen it. Oh, she's seen it already. Okay. Well, it's, okay. So Thomas Jefferson, among many things, is, I think, should be our guiding light when it comes to uh, protecting ourselves against tyranny and we should avoid ourselves becoming the form of tyranny and that is what they're asking us to do. And if you read the definitions in the thing, it should scare you not that the definitions are there but that they were ever allowed to be put into the regulation at all. Something went horribly wrong with the whole process. And I'm going to give you an example that no one's talked about yet which is carrier grade. For those of you who have ever worked in telecommunications, which is a lot of you, Carrier grade is, by definition, means reliable. It's a marketing term. And how I think it got in the regulations is I think Privacy International used it in one of their random little reports. They're like, we're scared of anything carrier grade. But carrier grade is not, uh, it's not a metric for speed. Yet, if, you, if I magically made you zoom in with your eyeballs and you zoomed in on this thing, in the actual defense of the regulation that BIS had, they, ha they said, well, we think it's anything fast enough for a, you know, a city or a country, but we won't put an actual number on it. And the reason for that is because there is no number. And if you did put a number on it, it would have to go up exponentially over time. I live in uh, South Beach. Not that I'm recruiting because my company's awesome, but you, don't, you shouldn't move to it for South Beach. But South Beach has like every apartment can get, you know, 500 megabit to your door via a mesh network someone has set up. You can do the same thing in New York, you can do the same thing in San Francisco. And at what speed is carrier class? We are a small city. So I don't understand how, what the bar is. There is no bar. What they mean is we mean what we mean when we say what we mean, right? And that's, this should scare you because the penalties are so high for all of us for breaking these regulations that you are guaranteed to break them and you are guaranteed to be under that onus. What is a rootkit? It's not in there. If this was a program, this document would never have compiled. <laughs> Supports zero day exploitation. First of all, zero day is not a term you can define because it means something you don't know. And everyone has different amounts of knowledge. So. Uh, things that, that one of you knows may not be a zero day to me. They may just be something I have sitting around that I don't think is important. And to support zero day simply means you can run a program. So every, everything that qualifies as a command and delivery platform can in fact be modular and run programs. This is an extremely low bar and yet it's under the default denial section of the regulation which means that at some point they thought this will be fine. And that's just the beginning. Here's what's going to happen with the next regulation they come out with. There'll be a million more examples just like this. We have a process that's creating programs that cannot compile and making them with laws with humongous penalties. That's what's broken here. And the overreach in this area has massive, massive dangerous implications. Deemed exports alone means those of you who have H-1Bs are essentially cast out of our community as pariahs. Technical data is something that you as a human being cannot understand, but the lawyers among us will argue about for years at $1,000 an hour to tell you if you're allowed to open your mouth and talk to the person next to you. Required for, again, some of these phrases should scare you because if you as a person can't understand if what you're creating and exporting is required for the, the, the building and delivery of, con of command and delivery systems, then you are at risk no matter what you do. And that's what this regulation does. It puts all of us under this giant sword so that people can knock on your door and say, hey, by the way, I noticed you were uh, violating the law. We'd love you to cooperate on something else. 
That would be awesome. I can make this stuff go away. And there was a very bizarre section in the regulation when they went to def the defend it on their phone calls as they started getting some heat, which said that, well, if you release it to the public or the vendor, you're okay. But if you release it to, you know, just private industry, you're not okay. And we're talking about some value decisions in the disclosure arguments that don't reflect this community at all and don't reflect the industry at all. And again, just to nail this point down, penetration testing software, which is at its, this, regu this current regulation would have been restricted as much as a nuclear bomb, is a required operational practice for every company in America. And I think, you know, we talked briefly, uh, especially Mara did, that the, you know, export control, if you're going to apply it, should at least have some hope of accomplishing the desired goals. I don't believe the desired goals are worth accomplishing, but uh, I want to run this down here. Here's how you protect those poor journalists and activists against Finn Fisher and Gamma. And it is this. You give them an iPad. Because neither Finn Fisher or Gamma can attack unpatched iPads. So that's cheap. I am willing to donate iPads to these people to avoid regulation because I think it's a cheap way to do it. Here's what you, uh, what you don't do is uh, ban all software that makes you uncomfortable uh, at great cost to the rest of the world. And I think we should talk a little bit about licensing because even permissive licensing kills sales and retards innovation. Because in order to go through the uh, encryption controls, you currently have to wait one month after developing your, your software, and this is almost all software because the rule is anything that links to libssl is under this rule. And if you do anything to your crypto that changes your crypto or how you use your crypto, you are supposed to send them a note and explain it and describe it and wait 30 days and then you can do a release. And so if you've wondered why Core Impact and Canvas and Metasploit Pro are on a monthly release cycle, this is why. Uh, and it's extremely uh, difficult to, to innovate under this kind of conditions. And of course, anyone actually malicious, if there was a malicious Ethiopian person that, you know, Nate does not like for some reason, uh, then they could always get a Rackspace account. Right? And that's what they're going to do. So even at its best chances, there's no way export control could work even if it was meant to work, which it is not. So I think, you know, this community, all 700 people in here, are largely of the opinion that code is not a weapon. Code is speech. And I think part of the reason of that is we kind of understand something at a much more basic level which is that you can break down any fact into an infinite number of smaller facts which you can then combine up in combinations to produce the original fact. So for example, uh, if I was going to write a paper on if you have the extended instruction pointer, then you can use a certain technique to bypass ASLR. And then I would write a separate paper on here's how I would get EIP using Adobe Reader and a particular technique. And if I combine those things up, those are controllable. But if I don't, they're not controllable. And I think that's the key problem with regulation in any space where we're trying to regulate speech in this way. Uh, and, you know, the, of course, the irony of this is that when you see pri people who are privacy activists espousing these kinds of controls, they're not looking forward to the obvious next step, which is that to enforce them, you need a global surveillance network, which is a horrible thing to have to put into their... Um, uh, their hats. So in summary, their idea is bad and they should feel bad. And in the end what's going to happen if this stuff goes through as is or even close to as is, is that all of you are going to feel bad. So I'm hoping everyone takes that hour to comment on the next one and we can uh, further influence it by means of killing it. And that's, uh, and that's what I've got. And hopefully everyone now agrees with me and we can all go. Okay, so um, I'm Matt, and I should say, in spite of the introduction, uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, though I do occasionally impersonate one. Um, I'm a computer science professor, and one question is, you know, what am I doing here? I am, uh, you know, working in this sort of very abstract field, and you know, I'm not 
directly a target of these regulations in the sense that you know nobody thinks that what I do and what uh, people like me do is bad and needs to be regulated. I mean, the worst people say about what I do is that it's useless and stupid. Um, but you know, I don't think anybody says that what I do is harmful. Um, and I don't think even the um, uh, um, Wassenaar advocates think that academic published research in, in this area is something that is supposed to be regulated, or at least that's not a particularly um, uh, uh, common feeling. So, you know, it, it would be very easy for me as an academic to say this is something that I should just kind of sit out and watch and let people with a vested interest like, like Dave um, uh, fight this out for, for uh, their interests. And in particular, um, the work that I do, when you look a little closer at how it actually gets done and how these, um, how these regulations are likely to be implemented, particularly over time, I start to become a lot more worried. And one reason that I, I start to be worried is that, well, okay, I, you know, my job is to think of things and publish papers for the greater good, right? And, and you know, I publish things, and fundamentally, that's sort of a defensive activity. The more we learn about what to do, uh, the more robust systems we can build. But at the level of work that we're doing, the distinction between offense and defense is meaningless, right? And we, we can't study defense without studying offense. And in fact, if you look at the papers that we publish, we can tend to kind of flip around between defense work and overtly defense, overtly offense, um, back and forth, back and forth. Somebody publishes attack, somebody publishes defense, somebody publishes attack. And at the end of that arms race, we end up with something a little bit, uh, a, a a little bit stronger. So fundamentally, you know, I'm in the offense business as much as I'm in the defense business. Now, another thing that should reassure me is that I don't produce products and I don't export things and I don't sell things. But uh, and you know, they, it's it's true that um, you know, fundamentally, what we're doing is not producing in in the academic and research world. We're not producing code that we're selling to people or code that we're um, that that we're incorporating into attack. Uh, products, but when you um, but when you look at the process, there's quite a bit of code uh, exchanged, and there's quite a bit of exporting uh, going on. Um, about half, and that number, depending on your institution, will will go up or down. But it's um, but it's it's you know certainly in the ballpark. About half of uh, our graduate students are foreign nationals, um, and that's generally true at you know, any research-oriented uh, university. People come to the United States to, to study this stuff. Um, we have colleagues in other countries that we collaborate with. And the process of producing research is often involved in, uh, with a process of experimentation, exchanging uh, code, and working on things. Um, the export regulations effectively limit what I can say privately with my colleagues prior to publication. And that means uh, essentially it's not regulating the output of my work, it's regulating the process of doing my work in order to produce that output. So people who say, you don't have to worry because your papers are published by the First Amendment, um, you don't have to worry because this only affects um, you know, attack tools and you're not selling attack tools, um, uh, and you're not exporting things over uh, borders. That's true about the output, but it's not true about the process necessarily. Um, so even though you know there are many reassuring reasons to think that this is work that shouldn't um, that that I I and people like me shouldn't um, worry about, um, when we drill down to the actual process, this is something that me and all of my colleagues have to be worried about um, every day. Now I'm lucky that uh, I work for a big fancy pants institution that can afford lawyers. Um, and um, you know, fortunately at my institution, the lawyers that um, we employ generally see as their job finding ways for me to do my work instead of uh, finding ways uh, 
to stop me from de uh, doing work. And as soon as I, but as soon as I talk to them about export rules, they, that, that flips. Um, the answer tends to be, oh, you're taking some risk here. Um, oh, you need to worry about that. Oh, we better go and get a license um, to do this before uh, you do that. And fortunately, I have the support where they'll help me with this. But, um, but these are extremely difficult um, uh, um, rules to comply with, even in the easy case where you know that you don't have to make an argument, where you just have to go through the motion. Um, many people who are doing, you know, research of the, you know, at the same caliber or higher um, than people like me at universities aren't affiliated with universities and don't have that kind of institutional support. So for me, with institutional support, it's hard. For somebody without institutional support, uh, it, it becomes kind of a, a, a death knell. Now, the last thing that I worry about is um, as a veteran of crypto war one uh, in the 1990s, that was before we knew to number the crypto wars, um, the uh, primary uh, thing we were talking about was export law. Cryptography was, uh, was covered under ITAR um, the, uh, and the lever that the government had to regulate cryptography was not that there were rules about using cryptography do uh, domestically but that there were rules about using cryptography internationally. And um, that um, was what we were talking about in the first crypto wars. So what one of the, now we won that and now we you know they've largely deregulated most consumer grade and research grade crypto but what that illustrates to me is the way that um, regulations that are intended for to uh, accomplish one set of policy goals uh, here when they're uh, when they're implemented in the future can be used um, to accomplish other policy goals that weren't even on the table or being considered by, uh, by the people proposing them. And I worry here that you know, today we look at this and we say, well, nobody's meaning to regulate academic inquiry into computer security. Um, that may not be true um, you know, 10 years from now under the you know, um, Trump, Trump administration um, or, or, uh, or, or what have you. And you know, th these rules may change in the t uh, regulatory tone may change later. So, you know, this is something that I am, you know, I find worth engaging in and I think, you know, you need to, to, to consider whether it's something that you need to uh, in, engage in as well. So, thanks. So I, I also note that we have these little buzzers that make funny noises and we were supposed to press them if uh, anybody disagrees with each other. Uh, and nobody seems to disagree with anything any of us said. So. Well, I disagree that we won the crypto war. I think we actually lost. And so two of you have said we won, but uh, you know, when, you, when you sell software any, anywhere in the country out externally, you because every piece of software uses crypto in some way, you are under some very strict regulatory frameworks. And as much as like you're going to get a license, the fact is your sales process is going to be pretty messed up. You are sending away to the government a list of all of your customers, which some of you may feel uncomfortable with. And there's many other regulatory issues with uh, even understanding uh, these, these are not simple. These are some of the most complex, convoluted laws on the planet that you as a, as a you know, simple researcher are now being required to understand or else be under severe penalty. The same thing's true with crypto. I think we actually lost. So that's my personal opinion. So let me jump in on, on something Dave just said. Uh, the, the rules are very difficult to understand. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I, I'm going to look at this through a, a U.S. constitutional law perspective. In constitu and this is, again, going to be a gross oversimplification. In constitutional law here in the U.S., we have a, a, a doctrine called void for vagueness. If a criminal law is vague enough that an average person of ordinary intelligence can't tell whether their conduct would be criminalized or not, that law fails uh, constitutional scrutiny. Um, we, we've seen that it's, it's most common in, uh, in hate speech uh, or uh, incitement uh, contexts. 
Uh, but it works, it works here too, right? If, if an ordinary person of average intelligence reads the Vosnar control lists and can't understand them, uh, then the implementation of those control lists uh, would be a denial of due process and unconstitutional. Yeah, and that actually gets to one of the, the sort of core issues about export control, which is, like I said earlier, you can't control something if it is, you can't choose a choke point technology if it is ubiquitous. So when something is omnipresent, like encryption, like these command and delivery platforms, you run into the same problem. You don't know, and therefore the control fails. I think, you know, it's telling that, in fact, BIS has on their website uh, web applications that run you through an expert system to determine if certain phrases apply to you, such as required for or is needed by. Like, there's little phrases in the regulation that you cannot understand. Only the expert system can understand. And I think uh, they're meant to help you, but they design, they, they demonstrate that the design of the arguments is already vague. And if you talk to your local export control individual, which uh, unfortunately immunity gets the privilege of doing a lot, uh, they will tell you as well that even, even the lawyers under BIS don't really have a clear understanding of it that they can explain to you, for example, what software is meant to be controlled and what's not because these issues are so complex. And they're rarely, uh, they're rarely, they rarely go to court. You know, it's been really rare to see the crypto stuff result in a penalty against a company. But that's not as important as whether or not it's used as a hammer in general, which I think should scare you more. All right, so at this point, it's, um, it's pretty well established that the rules are intended to prevent the, the availability of surveillance software to repressive regimes. Uh, but there are questions about whether or not it, these rules are effective uh, in doing that and whether they would also sweep in lots of legitimate software uh, at the same time, if we can use that term. Uh, so uh, the, I, I'd like to give Randy an opportunity to respond uh, to that and um, sort of give, a, give some more context into how the rules uh, are, are uh, being tailored uh, to, to cover just what, um, what the original intent was. Well, thank you. I think that the comments are uh, right on point, um, that the Vasanar control list attempts to describe particular products, particular functionalities, and the intent was to narrowly define what was going to be controlled, but in fact what we have learned from the public comment process is that either the language is not uh, well uh, stated so that uh, reasonable people with uh, potentially different vocabularies uh, are reading the, um, the language differently and uh, as well uh, a number of unknown or unexpected products or activities are being swept into the control, and that's what we want to address going forward. Is there a way to capture um, the only the products that we're interested in capturing and only licensing those exports that are of concern? Uh, certainly from an administrative law uh, perspective, um, and as a regulator, I think it is a, a a poor use of government resources and a very poor use of company and industry and researcher resources to uh, 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 we lost her. She's gone. No. Network resources too. All right. Who wants to say something controversial? It's me, Dave. Oh. Yeah, Dave. All right. <laughs> Wait, I think she might be back. Hold on. Yes. Oh. yes. Okay, you're back. Are you back? I'm back? Yes. You're back, great. You said resources and then you disappeared. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I just 
meant that I think it's a poor use of everybody's resources, both the government resources and industry or uh, research um, researchers of resources to spend time worrying about um, transactions, export transactions, uh, or deemed export transactions that uh, are subject to a policy of approval. Um, there's no point in, in requiring licenses for those types of activities, and uh, so we should work to uh, only cover those uh, transactions that would be of concern. So in order to cover uh, just those certain transactions, it seems like it's a, a, a project of definitions. And a lot of uh, what, uh, what a lot of the concern is how intrusion software uh, is being defined, and and I think there's an even bigger question as to whether or not intrusion software is even capable of uh, any kind of meaningful definition. Uh, so I'd like to open that up uh, to you, Randy, first, and um, also I'd like to hear from the rest of the panel about uh, if there's any uh, anything to be had there. Well, I would just quickly agree with you from the comments that we've received. It is um, a problematic definition. Again, um, the people who are in, we, we have uh, government regulators trying to define uh, products, and then when people who actually deal in the products, in the technology, have looked at the definition, um, it either doesn't uh, uh, they don't understand it, uh, what it was intended to do, or they use the vocabulary differently, and that is a poor regulation then if um, there is a lack of understanding of what it covers, um, and particularly if it is uh, understood to be broader than it is supposed to be, then it needs to be, um, needs to be uh, revised. Um, the uh, frequently asked questions were an attempt to address that, but we got to the point where even in the answers to the questions uh, that we posted on our website, we were referring back to the regulatory language, and it, we just kind of got stuck because we didn't have uh, the correct vocabulary to address uh, the issues that were being raised. So that's what we uh, hope to look into in uh, the, rest, the next step of the uh, discussions. Thank you. So uh, as EFF, one of the things that we asked in our comments to BIS, uh, which was also echoed by Google among others, is that uh, Commerce Department and I guess more, more uh, saliently State Department uh, go back to the Vosnar arrangement itself. Uh, the next meeting uh, is at the end of this year uh, and work on not just clarifying the American implementation uh, through BIS, but working with the 41 member states of the Vosnar arrangement to add some clarity to the control lists there, um, right? Software that modifies the standard execution path of a program. What does that mean? Like, why are we focusing on that? Uh, and and that, that is not something that BIS can do alone. That's something that needs to, uh, to go back uh, to the Vosnar arrangement itself. So that's, uh, that would be our uh, best case scenario, is if BIS didn't just do a new, uh, a revised proposed rule and open it back up for comments, but that BIS and State Department go to Vosnar, change the control lists there to make them better, and then do a, a revised proposed rule and additional comments. And by make them better, he means let's just remove this. <laughs> because there's no good way to do this. And what you hear from people, he doesn't agree, but he's wrong. I mean, if I agreed with him, we'd both be wrong, and that would be terrible. And here's the thing. They will say that regulation in this space is inevitable, so you might as well, as an industry, feel free to come up with some language that you're willing to be bound by, and I will tell you this, that is a fool's errand and uh, is, is a trap that you should not fall into. And I think uh, even if you could describe all of today's software that you found abhorrent, the reality is you're also describing software that in the next generation is going to be required for normal operational business. Because this is a community that moves far faster than regulation and always will and always should if we're going to survive. And I think that when they say, please describe us some language that works for us today, you should say, I need, I need language that works for us forever. And it's not possible and therefore we should not do it. 
Also worth noting that the, um, the confusion arising from the Vassinar language is due in large part to the fact that Vassinar was never designed for human rights purposes. I mean, this was a, the export control regime that uh, Vassinar inherited was all about controlling arms. Uh, and several advocacy groups, uh, namely Privacy International and Cause, petitioned to get these category four and five entries added and they were successful. Uh, and one of the really irritating things about that is that they knew that Vassinar was not fit for purpose. They knew that export control would not work for these items, but they persisted. Um, and unfortunately, we're dealing with that right now. And, you know, good intentions and all of that, but this really was not the right way to go about it. From my perspective, uh, it's not the software that's really a problem, right? Uh, what, what hacking team does, what, what FinFisher do, uh, that's just, you know, it's a standard remote administration tool, right? It's, you, you can use, um, you know, uh, a, a, any of the remote administration tools would, would have worked just as well uh, to, to spy on, on my client uh, in the Ethiopia lawsuit. What, we're, what we care about, what matters, isn't the tool itself, it's the service, support, and most importantly, training that comes along with it, right? FinFisher doesn't cost very much, uh, but getting your intelligence agency all trained up to use it and then the ongoing support contract is what Gamma makes its money on. That's the problem, right? These, these tools are, these, it's not the tool. Uh, it's, it's, what, uh, it, it's what goes, it's the infrastructure surrounding it. And the Vossner arrangement was the, sort of designed to take that into account, right? Intrusion software is not controlled under the Vasna arrangement. It's the, it's the infrastructure around intrusion software that's controlled, uh, technology required for, et cetera, et cetera, um, but without, without tailoring it specifically to state uses. Uh, and it's those state uses um, that, that we see causing significant harm out there in the real world. Keep in mind, under, under U.S. law, if I'm, if I'm correct, and we have lawyers on here, anything that's designed specifically for U.S. government or military use would be controlled under ITAR. And the same, you know, this is something that no one mentioned, which is that actually Hacker Team was perfectly well regulated under WASNR, and they went to their local government, and they said, can we have a license? And the government said, yes, you can, for anyone, anyone you want. Uh, so even if under the most strict interpretation of these regulations, the reality is uh, those companies who operate out of smaller countries, which would of course be every company in this business if the U.S. decides to uh, implement these regulations, uh, can easily go to their government and ask for an out anyway. So even if there was a perfect language that applied only to really bad things, which we don't know what are, but if there was perfect language, it still would not work because you'd have every company going to their government and saying, hey, I just want an out. Well, and alternatively, you have to worry about pushing, pushing these governments into capabilities development. And I think Nate raises a really good point, which is that it's the back-end support which leads these technologies to be so harmful in those contexts. Um, but if, if these state surveillance agencies are no longer able to buy off the rack, um, they will, move to, uh, they will move to capabilities development for themselves. And that is a very serious problem. There is no unwritten law of cyber that says that Bahraini engineers couldn't come up with an equivalent of hacking teams RCS, especially now that the source code is leaked. So controlling this from the top down simply will not work. Especially when we're talking about activities that are done by 10 people with computers you can buy off the shelf. I think that's, uh, you know, the, in, the inefficiency of regulation in this space can't be overstated. So we're, we're getting a good sense of um, what, what the objectives are. It, I think, Randy, it would be great if you could fill us in a bit more on where these objectives come from. Uh, because I, I think a lot of people might uh, make the, the criticism that it may be 
uh, or at least ask the question as to whether or not it's properly within uh, the, the scope of the, the mission of, of BIS or Commerce or even uh, the government to, to be uh, taking a position as to what uh, types of software uh, should be made available to um, any particular uh, regime. Uh, so really the question is where does um, these, these regulations of course don't say on their face uh, you can't sell to a particular repressive regime and it doesn't define who the regime is, it defines the thing. Uh, so I don't know if you can, you can give us any insight into uh, where the input on these, um, these particular sets of regulations are, are coming from within, uh, within the, the U.S. So the, uh, there is an, uh, an export control uh, community involved with the export administration regulations prescribed by statute essentially the State Department, Defense Department, and the Department of Commerce. And uh, we all provide uh, expert group members to attend the Bostonar discussions. Um, the, um, the consensus was in 2013 that there was a set of products that was of concern um, within the scope of the Vassanar uh, mandate that um, addresses dual use products that can be used uh, by the military or by civilian uh, agencies uh, for civilian uses. And so that's how the, um, the language was added uh, to the Vassanar list. Um, then. Um, I think that it's fair to say that uh, immediately, even though we, we had the understanding at the time what the products were that were supposedly described in the language, um, that that was not uh, perhaps a, a good understanding and the co public comments have certainly borne that out, that there are many products in this space uh, that could be considered to be described in the control list language that were not intended to be controlled uh, under the control list entries. So uh, you know, we, we don't have a disagreement here. Um, there was an intent to control certain products, uh, but a good number of other products have been swept in in the technical description, and that's what we're dealing with now. Um, and all of the comments uh, so far have um, echoed comments that we received in the public uh, process and uh, will be certainly uh, taken seriously under consideration going forward. So speaking of, uh, oh, thank you for that answer. Uh, so uh, speaking of the, the public process, we'd like to open up the floor here to some audience questions. Uh, so you, they'll have to, we don't have a, a mic for the audience, so we'll have to um, make do, we'll repeat the questions and, and uh, we'd love to hear your input. Um, and of course, panelists, uh, feel free to jump in. Yeah. Line up behind Joe. Hey, so two questions. Um, is the only reason that we export control crypto the Wasmar arrangement? No. Wait, 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 wait. Second question. Is there any good reason to have export control of crypto at all? Considering especially what it's done in this case by bringing things under that would normally be available. So the question was, is there any reason or is the only reason we control crypto the Vosnar arrangement? Uh, and then the second part of it is, is there any good reason to control the export of, of cryptanalysis? So the answer to the first question is no. Uh, we, we have controlled crypto since, uh, since it, that's a pre vasanar thing. Um, that was crypto. Why do we, s and, and then the second half of it is why do we still? So cryptography was, was controlled under COCOM, which was the predecessor to the Vassanar arrangement. Um, and it's worth noting that when encryption first came, under, it first came under export control, it was not as sort of insane as it sounds now. I mean, encryption was sort of a big boy toy. It was something that nation states did. It was not, you know, in the era before personal computing, it was not ubiquitous. Uh, so export control might have made sense at some point, I don't think it still does. Um, and that was, a, that was another thing which uh, I, in, uh, in the comments I drafted for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, said is 
uh, before we, we attempt to do anything more in surveillance software, let's decontrol encryption just entirely. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure they're going to do that, but that was what I asked for. Right. And it, you know, it's also worth pointing out, the crypto export controls are a you know, perfect example of one policy goal um, for when the regulations were originally enacted, which was to keep crypto boxes out of the hands of military adversaries. You know, perfectly good um, public policy goal if, um, you know, there are crypto boxes and military adversaries that might be able to exploit them. Then all of a sudden software got invented, right? And suddenly, you know, we're, we're now worrying about law enforcement domestically. Um, and these, these um, you know, regulations that were enacted for a purpose um, completely different from what they're uh, being actually enforced for. So, so uh, Randy, um, just um, quickly on, on the crypto subject, uh, well, that's um, obviously not part of uh, Wassenaar. Uh, crypto has been regulated more uh, tightly in the past. Uh, the regulations we have now are relatively more relaxed. Uh, is, can you give us any insight into uh, any trends at BIS uh, with respect to how uh, crypto might be regulated uh, going forward? Well, certainly there have been a lot of um, uh, changes to the encryption entries. It is a boss in our control under Category 5 Part 2. Um, over, since I have been involved in the program, uh, fortunately we have had a series of decontrols in the encryption provisions. But in the same way that we have the... Uh, the technical description issues in the proposed control list entries, uh, we have them in the encryption provisions as well. Uh, for example, I would point to a couple of new D control notes, L and M, that we just um, implemented in the regulations in this May. And um, again, they are technical descriptions that are not exactly uh, product descriptions, and we're uh, in my office still trying to work through exactly uh, what products these decontrol notes cover and don't cover. And as I said, these are decontrol notes L and M, so that means there are uh, several others, uh, starting with A. And to go through all of this, it's a, it's a very broad control with many different carve-outs and uh, notes and so forth. Uh, we have limited the encryption controls to products whose primary function is communications, computing, networking, or information security, um, which uh, makes the uh, refrigerators not subject uh, who, that have, or the alarm systems that have encryption. And that's a good thing. That didn't happen until 2010. We're still working on that. We still would like to have a positive list. Um, we would welcome... Um, public participation in that process as well to try to make the rules uh, more uh, concise and uh, more understandable. Um, there are many permissive provisions in the encryption uh, area. Uh, many uh, license, There's a license exception that um, is very broad and, uh, for example, uh, applies to almost all deemed exports um, of technology. Uh, so uh, we have a very permissive regime in the end, but a lot of text to get there. And uh, certainly it could use a lot of improvement. Um, I could talk about the encryption controls all day. I have a day-long seminar that, uh, that, that goes from soup to nuts. Um, and um, we well. would like to continue to improve them. And again, we welcome uh, public uh, participation through the technical advisory committee process. Uh, for that purpose. Well, perhaps Thanks. one day there'll be uh, day-long seminars on what uh, intrusion software is next. Right? So uh, we, we've got a big lineup of questions, so we should take the next. Repeat the question. 
Yeah, I think the, the, the question is uh, as um, technology has, uh, I'm sorry if I'm paraphrasing, I didn't hear the whole thing. I think you were, you were getting at as technology has changed uh, is the, and, and the use of technology has changed, are the regulations still relevant or are the regulations following the technology uh, in an appropriate way? Well, I think he's almost saying as well that uh, if the, did we tell the NSA that metadata might be more important than data? by allowing people to export crypto because PGP use is rare. Anyone using PGP therefore needs to be looked at. And when we deregulate a little bit, but not too much, it's not everywhere, it's not omnipresent. So you can do a sort and select on just people using crypto uh, for targeting. That's a good question and no one here has the answer. So that's, that's not why crypto moved out of ITAR and into EAR. Crypto moved out of ITAR uh, because we, we won our case for Dan Bernstein. So. So, or he has the answer. We, 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 got the, we got the stronger crypto controls that resulted in export grade encryption uh, back in the 90s. We got those controls deemed unconstitutional. So that's why it was, that's why the, the crypto controls are now slightly less. Did they the value of metadata? No, that was not, not so the question is, uh, the, it was the value of metadata uh, part of the reason that the national security establishment in the United States was okay with that. Um, I, I think that they weren't quite thinking along those lines at, the, at that time. All right, next question, Colin. Uh, so I, I disagree with most of what Dave said, except for one point, which was actually we didn't in the crypto wars, but we got was a set of, a set of licensing regimes, uh, exemptions rather, that allowed for more permissive uh, exports. Actually, Dave, most of the time, you missed the fact that most of the time you probably but so I wanted to ask a question for Jim and Matt specifically, especially Matt because I didn't hear your voice. I read most of, I read actually all but one of the 264 comments that were posted to this. Most of them, especially the corporate customers, said actually if you get license the, the encryption license exception and apply them to this case, it'll probably be used. So I want to ask Matt, actually you fall under a BIS uh, licensing regime, especially an owner's one. Actually to a certain extent, even with the intrusion software, you fall under what's called license exception TSC, still for the research that you're doing, because you're doing academic or basic scientific research. Under encryption on a daily basis, how much do you run into the actual export control license regime? How much do you feel that that stifles your research? And what can that tell us about if we moved into a similar licensing regime, uh, into how we get into a safer space uh, based off of first story? And same with my for Jim as well, although Jim's going to have a lot more nightmare stories than he did. Right. So, Someone has to repeat that question. So, so the basic question, let me just paraphrase into a couple words. How, does, how do the crypto uh, regulations affect you, me, um, uh, in, my, in my daily work? And, and the short answer is the crypto regulations probably don't hurt um, my daily work that much because I've already spent enormous investment in figuring out where those boundaries are and I'm really, uh, and I'm comfortable with where, knowing at least where some of the bright lines are and, and how I can do my work without crossing them. You know, when it comes to intrusion software, uh, I, those, all of those lines are inherently a lot more blurry and I think what it will mean is I spend a lot more time talking to our uh, um, uh, lawyers at, at my very generous um, university and less time actually, you know, doing my day job, which is filing grant applications. <laughs> so uh, for Randy, uh, I think uh, the, the, the question, uh, you, I don't know if you heard uh, all of that, but I, I think there's um, sort of a lingering question as to uh, what kind of exceptions are there, would there be for uh, research use uh, perhaps uh, on, um, on intrusion software and, and those um, technologies required to build intrusion software? Well, we're, we're starting at the point with everything being controlled under the proposed rule. Um, the possibilities uh, going forward are 
from my point of view, endless. They could be um, certainly a broad license exception. Um, there could be changes to the control list language. So uh, it, it really depends on how the, the discussion um, proceeds over the next few months. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just add a quick, quick um, coda to that, which is that you know even academics occasionally end up finding themselves on the wrong end of export um, uh, control uh, investigations, and you know it doesn't happen that often, but it does happen, and it often happens in in, in very um, significant ways, right? In, in in physics and in 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 bio and and to a lesser extent in information systems. No. Well, I, I don't think you can paint it with, with, with um, that specific a brush. Yeah. Colin's the one person on earth who likes this thing. So if you want to know more about that position, I recommend you listen to his Twitter. Wait. I, I think we have time for about one more question. There's two. Two mentions. more? Two more questions. Ten minutes. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Make it quick. Uh, Colin is, is speaking on a different Boston Harbor panel <laughs> tomorrow, I think. Is it tomorrow? Yeah, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. You might uh, want to ask why they didn't invite any of you guys to comment before they put this regulation down your throats. Uh, I don't know if you noticed uh, the presence of Randy Wheeler on the panel. So the question was, uh, are, any, what, are any of us in favor of regulation at all? Uh, and uh, if, if not, uh, why don't we have a balanced panel? And of course we have, uh, we have Randy, who's the d director of, of export, <laughs> if you will. But there's a long discussion about this stuff. Feel free to post the Daily Dave Colin if you wish to propose things. So I think that the point is, is a valid one that uh, as um, the, you know, the, the software industry continues to mature and as, uh, as, a, as probably as, as, a, as a world we, we transition more towards uh, a future cyber war that uh, these technologies are going to <laughs> these yeah, technologies that, uh, that we're talking about here will become more and more relevant uh, on the battlefield and uh, there will be increasing uh, government interest, not just in the U.S., but increasing government interest globally in, in setting up some kind of regulatory regime. So I, it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that, that we're here today. And I think this is probably the first of, of quite a few uh, discussions like this that we'll, we'll end up having. And, you know, I'll, I'll say I'm not... You know, uh, I'm not sure that I would make a, a broad statement saying that no, none of this should ever be regulated in any way. Um, in fact, I can imagine all sorts of, of you know, uh, bad things that can be done with the kinds of, of, of software being discussed here uh, that may well deserve regulation. What I'm concerned with is I don't know how to draft regulations without enormous collateral damage. Um, and I would be in favor of regulation that controls the provision of support for these kinds of technologies to government end users. That would be a regulation I would get behind. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't care about, uh, you know, Metasploit, right? I don't care, I, I don't care about um, a remote administration tool. What I care about is the provision of support to uh, the domestic version of NSA uh, all across uh, the world. That should require a license. Uh, the, the tool itself, the technology behind it, um, you just go on GitHub. And maybe not an export license. Maybe it should just be something that you can sue people in U.S. court about like you're doing already, and it shouldn't be under export control at all. So with respect to who's for regulation, uh, it's worth pointing out that, uh, as, as Randy noted earlier, there will be uh, another round of proposed rules and another comment period. Uh, and I know that uh, the BIS is very interested in uh, hearing comments uh, from everybody who, who may be interested in, in, in submitting them. And as you, you know, she, she referenced uh, the, the number of them uh, earlier today. So 
Uh, I'd like to uh, hear her advice on what kind of um, comments are uh, most helpful to to BIS in in figuring out how to do this. Uh, but you know, just with the with the comment with respect to who's for regulation, uh, BIS is not in the business of making value judgments about uh, whether or not certain things should be regulated or not. It's it's, it's uh, there to fulfill its mission and to do the best job it can. So comments in general uh, that are directed to this is really horrible, go away, you're you're idiots, this is dumb. That kind of thing's not really going to be going to be that helpful, obviously. So, I don't know, if you can provide uh, some, something more helpful than that, and to, to guiding us uh, how to how to move forward with the comments. Well, again, the public comment period for the public for the proposed rule has closed. Uh, we certainly will accept uh, additional public comments, but they won't necessarily be in the record. Uh, but we, what we do want to do is, again, identify specific issues from the comments that we've received, the most important ones, and to try to flesh those out and uh, have all interested parties, um, the, the ecosystem, the constituencies, including government agencies that are involved in cybersecurity, to, um, to weigh in and help us uh, the interagency go forward um, as appropriate. Um, beyond that, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. There, there will be another um, proposed rule. Uh, it will not be a final rule based on this proposed rule, so there will be uh, opportunity for more public comments. We do have the technical advisory committee meetings, which we will advertise. They're, they're published in the Federal Register and uh, we can have open sessions where uh, interested uh, parties can discuss the, the issues um, that have been identified. And we do hope to have broad participation in that process during the rest of the calendar year. Thanks. Do you want to do one more question? Yeah, I think we have one more question. Uh, and a microphone. Hi. Um, there seemed to be pretty good consensus, at least among the panelists, on uh, the definitions being uh, not uh, not the best, and uh, the ubiquity of some of the tools and so forth. But I, I wanted to follow up on the the, the issue of um, service uh, being a service provider, support, um, and the sort of customer that you're selling these tools to, um, or people are selling the tools to. Um, Nate's one of his first slides said, you know, is it a government end user? Is it somebody else's end user? Is there some sort of scheme, a different regulatory approach that look that would conceivably work that would uh, sort of focus on who are the buyers and what are they doing with it? Or do you sort of lose it because if you sell to like an Ethiopian small businessman that eventually winds up in the, in the hands of the Ethiopian government, for example? That's a good point. So I think um, this is probably a good question for Randy. If I, if I understand the question correctly, it's uh, in, under, the, under a licensing regime, how do you discern who the end customer is as part of the licensing process. So if someone is selling to a uh, repressive regime or they're just selling to a uh, random interested, perhaps researcher uh, in that same country, is there any way to distinguish that as part of the, this process? So the answer is yes, and we have a white paper on how to do it. Uh, you, companies should institute a know your customer policy, right? Uh, we, we saw this uh, illustrated very nicely in the hacking team document dump. Uh, Mr. Desatels from NetRegard uh, sold a zero day to hacking team uh, and we, we saw an email from, from him to, to hacking team saying, I know who your customers are and I'm okay with it. Uh, so uh, that's, the, that's the sort of thing which uh, I, I would love to bring a lawsuit about. Um, but yeah, a, a robust know your customer um, scheme, I think, is the, is the best way of determining that. Flowcharts are magic <laughs> and have magic powers. Randy, do you have any further comment on uh, know your customer? Uh, put that here. Well, well, that's just right. That's uh, certainly a provision already in the export administration regulations, the know your customer in a licensing process. Um, the uh, end user, at times an end use statement are required. Um, and uh, certainly uh, in a license exception situation or no license required situation, the know your customer uh, requirement still, uh, still applies um, to, uh, to ensure that a license is not 
required. Thanks. Uh, just one more thing there. I, I think, honestly, the EFF's going down the wrong path here. I'm going to get him drunk. We're going to correct it. Uh, and I'll tell you why, and, and it's, it's pretty simple, which is that uh, the Huang Huang Technology Corporation calls you up and says they want a copy of some random thing, uh, some gadget or widget. Now, under the current rule set, you're theoretically supposed to try to find out if they are owned or mostly owned or controlled by the Chinese government. But in reality, no U.S. company can ever really know. There's no way to know. Uh, so even if you have perfect, and I, I think Immunity has perfect know your customer abilities, and you have a flowchart on your wall which explains it to your admin, because keep in mind, it's not a lawyer figuring this out. It's your, it's your admin, right? The same person who answers the phone. Uh, and they go through the flowchart and they kind of, oh, you have a web page, your web page looks good, it's all in Chinese, but I don't know, whatever. Um, so I would say that divi dividing a regulatory framework against this when anyone in China is very difficult to determine if they're a government-owned, government-controlled corporation or not uh, is probably not the right direction to go. Well, but the tools we're concerned about are tools that are sold only to governments, right? Hacking Team and, uh, and Gamma only sell to governments. So they certainly know who their customers are. Okay, and with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. The next panel is dying to get in and play with the AV equipment. They really can't wait for this. So uh, I'd just like to extend uh, some, some recognition here to, to Mara Tam, who uh, did some amazing things behind the scenes to uh, make this panel happen. And uh, also uh, thank you certainly to um, Randy Wheeler for uh, really this u completely unique uh, opportunity to discuss hey. these, uh, these proposals with you. And thank you to all of you for coming and uh, listening to this, uh, this talk today. Thank you.